Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, so we're really pleased to have uh, Sumi Krishna as our speaker today for the Alamani series, lecture series, which is, uh, this is the second talk in the series. And uh, this uh, uh, Alamani series, lecture series was an initiative of the Working Group for Gender Equity, WGG, of the Astronomical Society of India. And the first talk was by Rama Govind Rajan in uh, April 20, 2016, so two years ago. Um, and the WGG itself was uh, constituted three years ago. Um, so, a little bit, the series is about Anamani, uh, who is a pioneering physicist and meteorologist. And she has made, she made significant contributions to um, spectroscopic studies of materials, solar radiation, ozone, and wind energy instrumentation. And so, after graduating from Madras Presidency College in 1939, she got admitted to a PhD program in uh, the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, and she worked with C.V. Raman on spectroscopic properties of materials. Uh, however, she was not awarded a PhD degree at that point because apparently she didn't have a master's uh, degree uh, on her. So after that, she in 1945, she actually left India and she went to Imperial College London, uh, where she studied meteorological instrumentation. She returned to India in 1948 and then she joined the, the Med Department in Pune. Uh, and. Um, she retired in 1976 as the Deputy Director General of the Department. So uh, our speaker Sumi Krishna is also going to talk a little bit about Anamani in her talk. Uh, Sumi Krishna herself is an independent scholar and she has been the President of the Indian Association of Women's Studies. Uh, she has worked for more than 40 years on environmental, uh, sorry, environment, development and gender at the policy program and field levels. Uh, encompassing biodiversity, natural resource management, and livelihood issues. So she has been a visiting professor at various universities and institutions. She has been involved in the curriculum development, in particular with integrating gender in agriculture and environment, environmental science courses, research methodology, and practice. And she's authored several books and essays uh, and co-edited uh, this book, uh, Feminists and Science, Critiques and Changing Perspectives in India, uh, Volume 1 and 2. Today, Sumi Krishna is going to talk about how gender matter, how, uh, how does gender matter in physical science. So with that, I welcome Sumi. Thank you. I, uh, after thinking about it, I decided not to have a PowerPoint presentation and I'm actually going to talk. Ah, from a script, um, <coughs> and I will begin uh, straight away. Uh, actually, when we about three weeks ago, when she he talked to me about this, uh, it was not then the Anamani lecture, uh, but coincidentally, I was in any case going to begin with Anamani, so it just happened so. Um, in 1993. When Abha Sur, Abha Sur is a chemist who moved to uh, doing history of science and is based in the US, now at MIT. When Abha Sur began her groundbreaking research on the first three women scientists in C.V. Raman's laboratory, she met physicist Anna Mani in Bangalore. Mani, who had risen to the position of Deputy Director General, as she mentioned, of the Indian Meteorological Department, was most amused. She asked, why do you want to interview me? My being a woman has absolutely no bearing on what I choose to do with my life. What is this hoopla about women and science? In 2018, when another woman has just won the Nobel, Donna Strickland, uh, only the third woman ever to get a physics Nobel, she says she does not see herself as a woman in science. The cytogeneticist Barbara McClintock, who got the physiology Nobel in 1983, said science is not a matter of gender, for ideally, gender drops away. Evelyn Fox Keller, who is uh, a physicist, who worked at the interface of biology and who has one of the early people who wrote about uh, gender and science and who analyzed gender and science and also wrote a book on McClintock, said of McClintock, her adamant rejection of female stereotypes seems to have been a prerequisite 
for her becoming a scientist at all. Yet, over the last 20, 30, 40 years, we know globally that there is ample evidence to show that gender does not drop away and is critical in determining both educational and career choices. What would make a 15 or 16 year old girl in the Indian education system opt for physics, chemistry, math rather than biology or commerce or history? In the 1930s, when Anna Mani entered university, all the women physicists in India, she said, could be counted on one's fingertips. Then why did Anna Mani choose, choose physics? She said, not out of curiosity about the world or love of physics, but simply because she happened to be good in the subject. So good in the subject means what? Uh, that you get good marks in the maybe class 10 examination. Uh, half a century after Anna Mani's time at the University of Madras, in the early 80s, um, veterinarian Sagri Ramdas recalls her days as a student in Hisar in the veterinary college. There were only two women in a class of 80, some 10 women in the entire college, one of whom Nitya Gotke is here today, and only two women professors. She writes, we were outsiders in the traditional all male preserve. Veterinary science, after all, was considered a very male profession. So each day, for the next five years, catcalls and whistles greeted us as we entered class. We survived and learned to negotiate spaces for ourselves. Today, the challenge is to analyze and understand the gender dynamics to grapple with internalized biases and worldviews. What do we expect a woman to be or a man? What do we expect a veterinary scientist? or indeed a livestock farmer. Science is an institutionalized system of knowledge production, a part of society and also its product. Scientists, like other professionals, view the world both through their social experience and their disciplinary training. Gender operates at the individual, structural and symbolic levels in terms of identity, roles, systems of meaning, which create power relations between men and women. These gender dynamics are intermeshed with the dynamics of class, caste, ethnicity, religion, language, and so on. And each of these factors are also socially constructed and impact gender relations. So a gender lens alone may not do justice to the other axes around which our lives revolve. But keeping the focus on gender has advanced both the academic and the political project of uncovering and understanding the persistence of gender inequity. I will talk briefly uh, about <clears throat> uh, the natural science disciplines uh, where there is more work and then come to the physical sciences. Since the 1960s, socio-cultural and feminist critiques of the humanities and the social sciences have revealed how gender is written into various disciplines, how this shapes our conception of nature and women's nature. By the 1980s, the analysis was being extended to the natural sciences medicine, engineering, and technology. Cross-disciplinary analyses unpacked the gendered epistemologies of paleoarchaeology and anthropology, anatomy and physiology in medicine, botanical and zoological taxonomy, and evolutionary biology in the life sciences. Most notably, primatology was transformed by feminist perspectives. Looking back, theoretical physicist Evelyn Fox Keller, who I already mentioned, said that her aim had not been to change the world, but merely to change science. 
Surprisingly or not so surprisingly, these critics have had very little impact among natural scientists in India. In the late 1990s, I taught a social science component to NSC students of environmental biology in the University of Delhi. They were very bright students, but completely unaware of the critique of their own disciplines, and they struggled to apply the logical processes of science to matters of gender. Similarly, in my experience over many years of working mainly with male conservation and life scientists in field projects in coastal and southern India, I found that there was almost no awareness of critiques of science and that gender biases regularly crept into observations and analysis. The scientists would start with descriptions of what some women and men were observed to be doing. This was assumed to be cross-cultural, historical, and with universal applicability. The next assumption was that what was seemingly universal reflected the essential natures of men and women. So other assumptions followed that the division of ro labor, roles, and responsibilities in the family and community are natural and governed by hormones and genes. By this line of thought, male and female differences were perceived to be biologically fixed and determined by evolution and genetics. In order to understand how these perceptions developed in these young people, I began a more systematic examination seeking to understand whether and how gender bias in the attitudes of scientists is influenced by the cognitive culture of science in India and the narratives embedded in the life science disciplines in which they are trained. I have written more extensively about this work in an article, but here I will just give you a little glimpse of some of the kind of things that um, are very telling hmm? at the level of metaphor, classification and theory. And then I will come to the critical questions, six critical questions which I had uh, listed in the abstract. Um, the anthropologist Emily Martin's now classic study shows how metaphors of the egg and sperm in both popular and scientific accounts of reproductive biology are shaped by the cultural stereotypes of female and male. The egg is most commonly pictured as a passive, fragile damsel in distress, protected by sacred vestments, till the heroic warrior sperm attacks and accomplishes the mission of rescuing her. Despite the new understanding of the biophysics of the egg and sperm that show a more equal partnership, researchers continue to conceptualize the story through the old imagery of the aggressive sperm. Martin argues that these are not dead metaphors and the challenge is to wake up these sleeping metaphors of science. Now here is an example from the organization of disciplines. The passive female image which was um, a part of 19th century social, the social world is vividly reflected in a historical analysis. This is done by um, a person called Londa Scheinbinger, a historical analysis of the emergence of botanical taxonomy in the 18th century. Both Linnaeus and Erasmus Darwin introduced human sexual metaphors into botanical description. In the Linnaean system of classification, based on the sexual morphology of plants, classes depended on the numbers, relative proportions, and the positions of the male parts, which we call stamens now. Classes were subdivided into orders, similarly based on female parts, that is the pistils, reflecting the gender hierarchy of the times. 
Linnaeus used the Greek words Andrea, husband, and Ginia, wife, in the order of polygamia. He envisaged polygamous husbands living with wives and concubines in marriage bins. Today, we don't use the classes, these classes and orders in botanical taxonomy, but the lower rungs of the Linnaean classification system continues. Unlike the conservative Linnaeus, his contemporary Erasmus Darwin was a democrat and materialist. He saw the female character as mild and retiring. Women's education was to be directed to enhancing the home life of prospective husbands. This was in line with the broader political trend of that period that emphasized sexual complementarity between unequals. This helped to maintain gender hierarchies and make inequality seem natural. A hundred years later, the concept of sexual complementarity between unequals had a deeper imprint on the theories of human evolution, including that of Charles Darwin, who saw women as more nurturant, reclusive, and altruistic than men, because in their case, he said, nature does not work to select the aggressive male traits. In a now infamous passage in The Descent of Man, Darwin simply mapped upper-class Victorian culture onto nature. He writes, Thus man has ultimately become superior to woman. It is indeed fortunate that the law of equal transmission of characters to both sexes prevails with mammals. Otherwise, it is probable that man would have become as superior in mental endowment to woman as the peacock is in ornamental plumage to the peahen. In the 20th century, the notion of equal transmission of characters was succeeded by new understanding of human genetics. But the model of social relations between the sexes continued to prevail in the scientific imagination through the narrative of what has come to be known as man the hunter. Despite evidence in primatology, archaeology, anthropology, that women are not necessarily dependent on men, for household provisioning and may even be economically more productive, the passive female active male stereotypes in conjunction with man the hunter have had wide influence in different fields. In 1975, the entomologist E.O. Wilson contended that biology favors patriarchy. Men continue to hunt game, he said, now represented by money, and that denying this would lead to loss of efficiency. He claimed that even with identical education and equal access to all professions, men are likely to continue to play a disproportionate role in political life, business, and science. This sociobiological thesis, now the term used is evolutionary biology, not sociobiology, provides an invidious justification for all manner of hierarchies, of ethnicity, class, and gender. This was swiftly and comprehensively refuted by numerous scientists, feminists, and others. Yet, in the minds of students and practitioners of science in India, the Wilsonian argument prevails. Parallel to the critiques of the natural science disciplines, since the early 1980s, there has been a lively debate on the relationship between technology and society and the social shaping of technology. The popular conception of technology is that it is applied science. But even 150 years ago, technological developments were independent of science. Engineering is not merely applied physics. Technology uses science and science uses technology. Furthermore, both technical and scientific advances are incremental. And the many who contribute to this incremental process, women in particular, remain unknown. Studies of the gendering of technology have interrogated the projection of technology as masculine and the idea of technical competence as being integral to male identity. It has been argued that power lies in the ownership and deployment of technology, with women being either at the receiving end, as of military and medical technologies, or being manipulated and exploited 
operators as of typewriters, washing machines, and so on. Even when women are technically competent, they often do not perceive this as a valuable attribute. Uh, the reasons for this are complex. One critic says, when you see a woman take a set of spanners and approach a car, you suddenly become aware of the manifold informal pressures against women in public spaces using their bodies in the way men do. Getting dirty and sweaty, climbing up things, lying on the floor, spreading their legs, exerting muscular force. So now I'll move on to the next part of my talk. Till 10 or 15 years ago in India, very few were interested in the kind of gender analysis of natural science disciplines and technologies that I have outlined. There were a few broad critiques of Western science and more grounded critiques of gender and health. But this scarcely touched the basic disciplines. Therefore, during my tenure as president of the Indian Association for Women's Studies, we began a dialogue, that is 2005 to 2008, we began a dialogue in various aspects of feminist knowledge production, and we included science. First, we held a southern regional workshop on the struggle to transform the disciplines. Many of the papers were on psychology, medicine, veterinary science, etc., my own interest was especially in the approach and methodology of the science disciplines in India, and we followed this up at our national conference in Lucknow in 2008, where we had a sub-theme on gender, science, and technology. This helped us identify a group of scattered researchers working in this area, most of them independently, and we held another workshop, which led to a two-volume uh, book which I co-edited uh, uh, co uh, co called Feminists and Science, which she mentioned. <laughs> Curiously, in this process, what became very clear was that the physical sciences are not being critiqued in the same way as the biological sciences. This is true globally and in India. Now, why is this so? Is this because those sciences which are underpinned by mathematics are free from the socio-cultural embeddedness of the social and biological sciences of engineering and technology. But engineering also has fair amount of maths. Or is it because those who are interested in uncovering bias are located outside of these disciplines which are not easily self-taught? To critique a discipline, to unravel its language and culture, its metaphors, systems of classification, narratives, a researcher has to enter the cognitive space of the discipline. This does not seem to be happening for the physical sciences. Instead, what we do have are qualitative and quantitative analyses of gender imbalance in the physical sciences. Globally, the figure that is being mentioned is about a fifth of professional physicists and astrophysicists are women. The ratio of women to men becomes increasingly skewed at the higher levels of research and administration. This has led to questions about girls' motivation to do physics, about implicit biases that prevent their entry and progress in the discipline, about perceptions of merit and competence. Now I turn to these six interrelated questions, which I will take two at a time. How is a person's identity as a scientist constructed? And how is this related to public perceptions of science? Identity like character is not cut in marble. It is shaped by many influences, by reading and exposure, by how one is perceived in childhood by one's parents, teachers and peers, by recognition and achievements, by how one's professional interests develop in adulthood through opportunities and setbacks. What makes a person a maths person or a physics person or a biology person? Or even a disciplinary anarchist as I was once called by a university vice-chancellor. The biologist Richard Levontin says, Scientists do not begin life as scientists after all, but are social beings 
immersed in a family, a state, a productive structure, and they view nature through a lens that has been molded by their social experience. So how does the social experience of gender and of caste in the Indian context shape one's identity? In 1993, the monthly journal seminar had an issue called Our Scientists. Seven autobiographical essays by distinguished liberal and progressive scientists, all men. The, the seminar is an Indian journal, all these were Indian male scientists. The scientists had been invited to interrelate individual biographies to the wider issues of knowledge and organization, politics and culture. It was hoped that each scientist would become his own case study, reflecting on what it meant to be a foot soldier or even a sergeant in the grand march of science. In keeping with the male-centric metaphors of marching soldiers and sergeants, the essays reveal a consistent gender blankness. Women appear in passing as mothers and wives. One person mentions a daughter. Only one scientist mentions a woman mentor, a university teacher. In that collective story of the making of our scientists, that is 1993, <laughs> women are recognized as helpmates and inspirers and occasionally as providing professional support to the male scientist. Uniformly, there's a lack of self-reflection on matters of social location. Um, even in Leelavati's Daughters, 2008, the more recent collection of autobiographical studies of distinguished women scientists, one can discern a certain distancing from their social locations. Ava Sur, who I mentioned earlier, has analyzed the confluence of science vis-a-vis -vis caste, nationalism, and gender in modern science in India. Her work focuses on C.V. Raman, who was from an educated, upper-class Tamil Brahmin family, and Meghnath Saha, who belonged to an uneducated, rural family of modest means and an unprivileged caste, OBC, in Bengal. In a talk at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in 2011, uh, Ahabasur sketched the possible linkages between Saha's approach and his social location. This sparked an email conversation among a group of women researchers including some scientists, one of whom was Prajwal Shastri, by the way, which was later included as the first chapter in Feminists and Science. In that conversation, physicist Anita Mehta said in their mature work, most of India's scientists seem to have spoken the universal language of science rather than one derived from their individual backgrounds. In Indian science, she felt, caste was irrelevant in comparison to gender. Is this really so? Consider the autobiography of nuclear scientist Raja Ramanna. At one level, this is a straightforward narrative about his life and career. But unpacking the text, one critique says, it reveals the anchoring of Ramana's identity in caste, deep-rooted discomfort with the masses, and a reading of politics as something that thwarts merit. This runs as a countercurrent to the democratic egalitarian outlook that Ramana also professes. The critique uh, highlights this un says he says this uh, the critique of Ramana's um, autobiography says that this highlights the unself-reflexive majoritarianism as one of the realities of upper-caste, middle-class Indian. To understand how one's identity as a modern Indian has been shaped by gender and caste requires a degree of self-reflection that most professional scientists and others lack. It is a rare scientist who can bring self-reflection into a technical discipline. In her doctoral study of soil, agricultural scientist Meghna Kelkar is keenly aware of and openly discusses the social markers 
that delineate her as she traces the epistemological roots of her research and her own path. She describes this as a journey through an alien terrain, a journey which is an essential and conscious exercise. Kelko's work also shows how one's sense of identity and public perceptions are intertwined. The lay perception of science is mediated through the public perception of individual successful scientists rather than through an understanding of science or through developing a scientific temper. The old image of the famous lone scientist, usually male, continues to persist. There is romance in this view, in the popular figure of an elderly Einstein, or more recently that of Stephen Hawking, or even a pioneering woman scientist like Marie Curie stirring pitch blend in a makeshift laboratory. These are romantic images. But as in any professional field, the star renders invisible the large numbers in the background. In this case, women scientists and technicians in India, casual observation shows that women technicians are strictly increasing, pharmacists, opticians, lab technicians, and so on. But we have no information on this, absolutely no information. Indeed, it has taken years for information to trickle out about the women who worked as computers in Harvard in the 1880s, dismissively referred to as Pickering's harem, the kilo girls of Britain in World War II, supposedly each with the energy equivalent to a thousand hours of computing labor, or the black female mathematicians, the hidden figures in the US space program that put men on the moon. Margot Lee Shutterly, who told that story, says, most people are astonished that a history with such breadth and depth involving so many women and linked directly to the 20th century's defining moment has flown below the radar for so long. This image of the lone scientist, whether male or female, is fed by media and film, and even by the science establishment. It does not conform to the way most cutting-edge science is done today, by collaborations among many scientists, within a discipline, across disciplines, across countries and continents. And it also does not conform to any to the way small engineering projects, for example, are actually carried out through multidisciplinary teams. In a situational analysis of women water professionals in South Asia, the first study of its kind, led by Seema Kulkarni, a uh, hundred professionals were covered, including engineers. The low number of engineers in particular was determined both by the type of work women do and the content and structure of engineering science itself. The skills of irrigation engineers were underutilized, women irrigation engineers, in unchallenging desk work, but the choice of work was beyond their control. Women were kept away from site work, which was believed to require physical strength and hard technical knowledge and competence. And women were also kept away from the financial management of projects. It is not surprising then that in the public perception, women and engineers and technical experts do not exist in the water sector. So following up on this study, um, there was another project initiated on South Asian women water professionals with which I was also associated, irrigation engineers, administrators, scientists, researchers, and so on. Um, as we wrote in the preface to that study, the women's stories depict the rare motivation and determination that characterizes them in their personal lives and the public sphere of water management. One of these women, Chief Engineer Badra Kamaladasa from Sri Lanka, who set up the Department of Dam Safety there, said she took up engineering, very reminiscent of Anamani, simply because she got the best marks in mathematics in school. Mm -hmm. Of the 150 students in her civil engineering class, only 10 were women. Anecdotal evidence and some recent trends in engineering, irrigation engineering comes under civil engineering, and anecdotal evidence 
seems to show that some space is opening up for women. So maybe men are moving out of civil engineering or out of engineering altogether. But um, the public perception of engineering science and scientists have not kept in pace with this. How, this is the second set of questions, how does the number of women professionals in a science matter and how does this relate to the implicit biases that may affect women's entry into and progress as scientists? Self-identity as scientist, as a scientist and public perception of science seems to impact the number of women professionals. There is evidence that diversity can influence the way science is done, the questions that are asked, the methodologies that are adopted. The critique of fundamental concepts of history and sociology, for instance, is certainly related to the higher number of women from diverse backgrounds in these fields. From experience in other workspaces, we also know that a critical mass of women does result in more equality in some practical facilities, the availability of washrooms, the height of a lectern, um, the provision of creches. So men, but men, as we were talking last night, men also have children and babies, and men can also take their children to work, even if there are not women uh, in that workspace. But anyway, uh, a large number of women may also serve as a support system against some forms of workplace harassment. But my own feeling is that it is likely that numbers alone do not matter. In India, as in other countries, there have been initiatives to encourage girls to opt for the physical sciences. There are many assumptions about why girls are not doing so. Physics being seen as masculine, the lack of female role models, but such assumptions have rarely been tested through quantitative and qualitative studies. This is now beginning to change. In the US, which got, had gender parity in the biological senses, maybe in the late 80s, but where sharp imbalances in the physical sciences continue, a 2018 study, a study reported in 2018 by Zara Hazari and her team, experimentally tested five factors that were commonly assumed in the U.S. would benefit the career interest of female students. Having a single-sex physics class, having a female physics teacher, getting a female scientist as a guest speaker in physics class, discussing the work of female scientists in physics class, discussing the underrepresentation of women in physics in the physics class. The data show that the single most important factor that could make a change is, a bit surprising you may say, discussing in class the underrepresentation of women in physics and the kind of career problems they could face. Which means that these students are actually more mature than we give them uh, credit for. The student's relation to the physics teacher was also of some significance. But this was not specific to a female teacher. A single sex class or a female scientist guest speaker had no impact. Another study by an interdisciplinary team of US scientists, 2012 study this is, expressly addressed the biological and physical science faculties possible gender bias. The results were clear. The faculty, male and female, subtly favored male students. The study, the study concluded that faculty gender bias impeded women's full participation in science. Therefore, they suggest that interventions that address faculty gender bias could further the goal of increasing women's participation in science. A 2017 study from Austria looks at gender differences in students' motivation for the physical sciences and whether this is linked to the teacher's implicit cognitions. The study found that there was a positive correlation in gender differences in motivation and a possible correlation in educational aspiration. 
There is another interesting study, and this is on astrophysics. Six, um, it's about, it is a qualitative study, 2018, from Canada, which follows two female doctoral students in observational astrophysics. The detailed case studies show how these two students cope with the prevailing discourse of physics as a gender-neutral discipline. The research indicates that cultural models of the discipline did not fit with the female students' experience and at times interfered with their careers. Although the career trajectories of the two were very different, both continued to identify as physicists, but repositioned themselves as teachers rather than researchers. This is a phenomenon that we have also seen in India. It cannot, of course, be assumed that the results of these recent studies from North America and Europe would hold for female students in India. Um, girls' educational choices in India are often not individual choices, but the outcome of a familial decision. Economic factors, the sheer expense of higher education in science and technology could deter families from choosing disciplines that are not perceived as having job potential. This is especially so given the patriarchal structure of society and strong restrictions on women's sexuality, mobility, and so on. And now I come to the last two uh, questions. How is the concept of merit competence in science shaped, and how does this impact institutional structures? The concept of merit is the most contentious issue in the science academy. Merit is often the reason given for exclusions of any kind. In her pioneering work on unraveling the gender merit conundrum, mathematician Jashri Subramanian had the advantage of being seen as a fellow scientist, an insider. Nevertheless, women scientists did not want the issues that they shared to be discussed outside. As an outsider, I also had a similar experience at a training seminar attended by many women space scientists, I was heckled for raising questions of gender bias and exclusion. But later in the tea break, some of the women came to me and said, there is discrimination, but none of us will speak in public because it will be detrimental to our careers. Jashri Subramaniam, in spite of this wall of silence, was able to reveal that the many ways in which merit was used to marginalize women and strengthen male domination in scientific institutions. As she says, underrepresentation of women in science is only the most visible aspect of the gender question in science in India. Subramanian's data show that women's competence and commitment to pursue science are doubted by male scientists, peers and um, faculty, their progress is invariably attributed to hard work rather than talent for science. As with women in many other professions, women are too easily excluded by the presumption that they will leave science to care for their families. She says blatant and subtle exclusions are aggravated by the way science institutions function. Under the control of a few powerful scientists, mainly men, I quote, personal connections make a difference to what a scientist can achieve. So to succeed, it is important for scientists not only to do good work, but also to lobby. For more than one reason, women do not find it possible to make personal connections as men do. So when does a woman's contribution gain recognition as knowledge or as having been significant in building up a profession. Mandira Sen, writing of Ajita Chakravarti, India's first practicing woman psychiatrist, uh, asks, Chakravarti joined the West Bengal Government Health Service in 1960, and her career was contiguous with the formation and growth of the discipline of psychiatry in India. She was an uncompromising woman with strong views that ran counter to the discipline that was being established. She had to fight marginalization at every step. 
She argued that academic psychiatry was so strongly biological and medical that it was almost devoid of social and human dimensions. For a new orientation to emerge, she felt, there had to be greater awareness of the local experience and cultural context and that this was especially important for women. Mental illness may be caused by biological factors but was manifested through language and non-verbally in a particular social context. Her work remains largely unrecognized even today. She did not see herself as a feminist, but her ideas are at the core of many critiques of medical and mental health practice today. If gender and science is a conundrum, caste and science is even more so. Educationist Meena Swaminathan has been forthright in drawing attention to how merit is used to mask caste, caste prejudice of many leading scientists. In the email conversation that I referred to earlier, she says, they do not even try to cover it up or make excuses because surprisingly they do not yet think it is embarrassing. Most of them are strong believers in the merit theory which they are unable to define because they do not have the vocabulary the cultural capital to talk about it rationally, scientifically. She says people who are convinced of their intellectual superiority and are, are unaware of what has produced it and often claim in all sincerity to be casteless. Women scientists she says, are too busy confronting their own problems of gender to boast, unlike the men scientists referring to some of the autobiographies of male scientists. Hmm? <coughs> it's not that they are unsympathetic to others who are, un who are deprived or are underprivileged, but they tend to stand shoulder to shoulder with their men on issues of merit. The success of increasing numbers of upper class and upper caste women scientists, in, indeed professional women as a whole, is fraught therefore with a contradiction. While women struggle to enter and survive in male dominated professions, there has also to be an awareness that both men and women who do not have their class and caste privileges continue to remain excluded. So now I come to the last concluding part of my talk. We in India have a tradition of collecting statistics, even if often contradictory and confusing. There is a lot of data available from the regular All India Higher Education Surveys on trends in women's enrollment. Uh, it is self-reported data, so there is some problem there, but anyway. In 2015-16, the percentage of women pursuing science is calculated as 19.1%. But this is a fraction of the total number of women enrolled in any discipline, not a fraction of men and women in science. So from those figures, it's not easy to figure out, to tell what is the ratio of women in science. Um, Rohini Godbole and Ramaswamy calculated that in 2008, 19.5% of women were in government laboratories and teaching institutions, of which 10 to 12 were in the premier institutions. A recent study has been conduct, uh, commissioned by Niti Ayog, um, 2018, to understand the reasons for the loss of trained female scientists from scientific manpower in India, manpower in India, and identify policies and best practices for retention. Mm. There are some, it's, it's a sort of survey with questions and um, um, there are some problems with the kind of questions asked. But anyway, so there are these surveys, but despite all this data that is being collected, contradictory, confusing bits and pieces here and there, uh, there is no coherent understanding and evidence-based strategy initiatives for female students or scientists. Whatever is there is ad hoc and piecemeal. Hmm? The kind of special considerations that someone like Anna Mani so disdained. This year, for the Department of Science and Technology has started a Vigyan Jyoti scheme and has allocated 20 million 
for 15 premier institutions, always to premier institutions, to encourage rural girls to opt for science. Now, the one such Vigyan Jyoti program was held recently in Gauhati. And I only came across it because I have uh, done a lot of work in the Northeast, and this was by chance that I came to know of it. And some 30 school girls from Northeastern states, tribal, non-tribal, were brought to Gahati for three weeks. They were given 5,000 rupees each, and uh, they, were, uh, may, they were taken to museums, and then they were, uh, there was program, the main part of the program was interacting with scientists. Which scientists? Scientists from NASA and the Indian Army. Huh. I mean, it, so I, I don't know who thinks up these programs. As, as Prajwal Shastri has pointed out, schemes for women scientists, such as DST's career break fellowships, operate in a climate of hostility and backlash without denting the deep structures of gender bias in institutions. She has suggested that career breaks, flexi times and so on should be gender neutral, available for women and men. This would be seen as fair within the scientific academy and hopefully nudge men into taking on some of the caring responsibilities in the family necessary for a more gender balanced society. I believe that we do need to talk about gender imbalances in both male dominated and female dominated professions. Um, the single most important obstacle, it seems, to strategies that impact deep institutional and organizational structures is unrecognized automatic bias among science educators, practicing scientists, science administrators, policy makers. Because implicit bias is implicit, it is difficult for most people to recognize that it exists. But one can test oneself. There is a very, there's an excellent Harvard implicit attitudes test that are available online. They're very well designed. They're based on the speed of association and they cover many different um, ingrained binary concepts and each set takes only 10 minutes. So while I was preparing this talk, and I thought, okay, let me take the test. Uh, I took four of these tests, and I'll tell you my results. Slight automatic association for male with career and female with family. Moderate automatic association for male with science and female with liberal arts. No automatic preference between young and old people. Slight automatic preference for abled persons over disabled persons. Does this surprise you? It should not. One can consciously strive to minimize bias. That does not mean that one is entirely free of socialized automatic associations. Um, Using interdisciplinary methods and tools to study and uncover the implicit gender and task biases of individuals and institutions would be the first step in a process of addressing persistent gender imbalances in the physical sciences. I'll end with a little, um, there, I don't know, there is a philo um, philosopher of science, actually a philosopher who wrote a lot about the um, about science and nature, and who died three weeks ago at the age of 99. Her name was Mary Midgley, and her latest book was published in September. So she's been working right through. And one of the things she says, which fits very well with this, is that she says that there are all these implicit and um, biases in the social. There are narratives, there are myths, what she called myths in society, which we, everybody absorbs. And then you take it with you into whatever work you do. So a scientist takes these myths into the science. There's no problem, I mean, that is what happens to everybody. But then it structures the science itself and the language of science. Hmm. And then what is really the problem is it acquires these biases, acquire the authority of science 
and then come back to society. And that is the problem. Thank you. So we can have a, a question answer session and some discussion. So feel free to start. That is not my statement. I was quoting that study. Huh? See, I mean, it's just a study. It is that those five uh, things that somebody called Zara Hazari, something, Zara, I forget the name, huh, who has done, see, seen a recent study. And um, I also, I think it's interesting. And, um, but this is what, and it's quite an extensive study. They have covered, uh, you know, in terms of numbers. And it's done very mathematically in terms of how they have interpreted the results and all. So you will probably, I can give you the reference, you will look at it yourself and you see. But the thing is that there are many things which seem counterintuitive. You know, you would think for this study which says that by talking, I mean, if that is counterintuitive in some ways, but by talking about the problems, by saying that women are underrepresented in this field, these are the problems they face, but somehow seems to have had some motivational impact. Huh. So, so it's interesting. But we don't have studies. I mean, we are not doing these kind of studies. Why not? So we could do it. Yeah, it is. It, I mean, it may. Yeah. I personally, though I mean not having, that's just off of the top of my head, I don't think the role model is such a big factor. I don't think, but you know, that's a personal thing. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with you. I think it depends on age. Mm -hmm. for, for younger people, I think role models are important. So you say seven or eight or whatever. And I suspect the study was done on older people, on teenagers or, the, the, or, or undergraduates. And yeah, because they were already doing physics. Exactly. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. The role model is less important then, I would suspect. Yeah. The physics teacher is important, but whether male or female doesn't matter. So it's the relationship with the teacher. So that that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I was intrigued by this most commentary to tell the subject you reported when you yourself took the test. No, I'm not at all surprised. Uh, because uh, after the... Know, you can't try to be, you can try, see it, you know. Um, it has these sort of, first it introduces some words and things. And then it also switches the hands because maybe you're swifter in one hand or the other. And uh, it's just the speed with which you touch, you know. And then after that they ask some questions, including something like this, you know. Were you surprised by the result? Uh, which they said is not, you know, part of that, but it's part of their study. Uh, it's, 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 you should, there are lots, there are, I think, at least about 20, 30 such things. I just, out of curiosity, where I thought, let me try it. And, but I'm not surprised. Because, see, these are things that, um, I'm not surprised now because I've been working on these kind of things for so long that you, everybody has, uh, it's a word association. So, you know, you associate something, the word association is so deeply ingrained. Huh? Or is it just the, what is ingrained is what you've grown up with? Yes, yes. But so, so the question then therefore is to recognize it. So this helps to recognize. So what is surprising is that you know, if a person like you, <laughs> yes, you yes. can imagine how much work you have to do to Yes, of course, of course. It's a very, it's a, I think it's a, yeah, you were going to say. Yeah. I have comment on this. Because yeah. so, so this uh, I, I've taken the gender tests about five times between 2013 and 2016. Uh -huh. And we did a similar study in, in a meeting in California uh, 
with about 50 people. And we found that, so, uh, in various which I thought really should be done about if the implicit group were doing it, which is to, to check whether <coughs> actually taking the test a number of times causes you to, to move in, a, in some direction. Could be. You would imagine that. And so, so, we, so we did a kind of a hand-waving <coughs> thing on this. <coughs> and we found that the subset of people who showed slight uh, <coughs> Who were in the in the forty five to fifty five percent? All had taken the test before more than four times. Uh, None of the others had. So there was a bias in the in the in the outcomes in this in this fifty percent study. But so I, I would be interested in this kind of a thing. Just do it once a year or once in a few months, and and check whether on a group of people do you find that you actually went because that would that's an intervention based approach which could move you towards. To, to, which might reduce your implicit bias. So, so I wanted to ask you, so did you have different results? Yeah, we did. So, so we had no, five... No, uh, <coughs> actually, when you did this over many it years... Was, it was too small. And it, it, it was five... five but see, what, what uh, from, uh, uh, from experience of other fields and with natural risk, with life scientists, I would say that what changes, and especially for young people, you know, we were talking about this yesterday evening. Um, uh, older people is always more difficult, but younger people are often uh, more open. And um, um, exposure, it's the way, you know, the way it's, re it's reading, not only reading, exposure, um, exercises which we, there are various kinds of exercises by which not, this, this is one example, but there are lots of ways in which it can be brought out. And often, again, it is maybe somewhat counterintuitive if you have not been in the field, is that I have found that often um, young men coming from very rural backgrounds, very uh, underprivileged backgrounds, are very swift in picking up things because their life experience has taught them things which middle class students from say elite colleges have not had that kind of experience. So, you know, the, the, um, we don't have um, people use sensitization, orientation, training, all these words are not the ideal words, but some kind of um, um, especially in groups, you know, through role play, through theatre, uh, through film, critiquing films. These things are very useful ways of um, understanding and bringing out um, biases that exist. I was actually very interested in your point, the lone wolf, or lone, uh, sorry, not lone wolf, the lone, lone wolf. <laughs> it's actually like the lone wolf, the lone person, yeah. the scientist versus the hidden figures kind of, you know, yeah, many, yeah. many women or, you know, yeah, yeah. places. And it, you look at lab technicians, as you said, in the service sector, which is emerging now, you have a lot more women. For example, you know, we go to the base and in office, for example, we have women sitting, you know, behind uh, the scenes, so whether it's there are lots of technical women lots at that level, of them at but we have no information. Invisible level, actually. Again, they're yeah, very yeah. invisible, yeah. but probably really, you know, plugging into a system and contributing in several ways to a new future. I'm not even making it a good, bad, no, are yeah, yeah, entering, yeah. are there data on entering this? And you, you have the same thing coming up. Oh, women are there because they're much more... Um, uh, particular about doing something. The very silly thing that came up. That they are docile, that they are, uh, their fingers are more agile, agile, all kinds of in these things. In the poultry sector, which is a sector we are associated with, you have in the industrialized poultry sector, which is in these big things, women are egg handlers. Because you see them as people who will not damage the eggs, you know, and, and of course, you, as you said, more docile, they will obey rules, they'll come in on time, leave on time, and you know, these things do persist in several sectors. So I actually would, would be very interested in studies being, you know, conducted. Or, I mean, I think the whole lab technician area is, because, you know, we're talking about women in science, why don't we talk about women lab technicians? 
And diagnostics, you know, they're coming up. And, and yeah. Oh, so why are we talking about women in science and uh, disparity? Don't we also talk about the fact that science in many cultures, especially in India and Asian cultures, is very aspirational? So, in the focus of science, we tend to neglect our arts, our humanities, and our philosophies. And that has, in some ways, led to a lot of discrepancies because, in the medical sciences, for example, philosophy, which used to be taught some 30, 40 years back, is almost being removed completely from the medical field. And possibly it has nothing to do with gender. But the aspirational success of science is now viewed in this very uh, hyper-specialized field that we've kind of lost out on the larger picture. And then the men who go into liberal science or liberal arts are often considered to be failures by society in some ways, which is equally sad. So mm -hmm. we talk of gender parity should also be the fact that, yes, we need more women in science, but we also need men in other fields, not to say that uh, that balancing shouldn't happen. I mean, we do, yes, India in that sense is a patriarchal society, so women have had a prejudice against them, but the fact that men are then told, oh, you have to become engineers or doctors or lawyers, also tends to prioritize or narrow their focus in a very um, specific field, and many of them are high, very unhappy. And if you look at... Um, See, high gender high constraints men and women. Yeah. It's not only women, but it does so in different ways. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> But this thing about like in the education system, in the, I think in the 60s, 70s, maybe even in the early 80s, history of science was part of all uh, undergraduate science courses. It is no longer so today. There's no space for history of science. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly what, whereas uh, maybe there should be. I mean, all, this, uh, all yeah. the social aspects have been taken out of either and also engineering the, courses as well as we know for sure the veterinary courses. And it's done at a very early age, no? After you're making these choices, at what age when you choose your stream? 16. You know, no, it's too, it's too early. question that was discussed yesterday sure. evening, which, huh? which was about, which the... was about um, men having an innate, um, yes, you Everybody know, I it. think it's an interesting question which sure. was raised outside of this room. Yes. Huh? But, but that was not about men having People having an innate advantage. Okay. Okay. Some people yeah. having an innate uh, advantage maybe uh, in being a physicist, I mean, they may have yeah. Yeah, that's a good question to raise, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, but we, it's good to engage in that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I would like to know whether, yeah. you know, how other people feel about it. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, uh, uh, the Scandinavian countries, they have uh, the, the best gender equality index and everything. So, you would expect that if they have developed into uh, the closest we have uh, for an egalitarian uh, society in the world right now. But the, the ratio of uh, uh, female, uh, male to female engineer, uh, engineer is, is something like 20 is to 1. And uh, on the other hand, the, the, the ratio of uh, nurses is the, uh, the inverse of it. So uh, is that a paradox or, or uh, is it gender equality in this as not doing this There are two, 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 two ways to look at it. One is that, like you know, she said earlier, uh, you know, there are so many different fields of life and maybe, you know, where um, jobs and um, security is not a pressing thing, then you're free to choose where your um, sort of inclination and talent takes you. So that may be one reason. Um, there is, I have looked at the, I mean, because the figures are so confusing, I didn't want to refer to it at all and really requires more work, but I've looked at the global figures which are available with, from UNESCO. And every two years or every year or two years, I think, they are updated. So these are, of course, each country is reporting. This is physical sciences. Hmm. Reporting the ratio. So you can get the ratio of women to men in all this. And um, 
there are lots of surprises there. Uh, which country do you think has the least number of women physical scientists? The bottom of that list. Which country? Or? The number ratio of women to men, which is the lowest. Uh, you, I don't know how, you know, whether you can take those, they are self-reported figures from each country, but it's a very surprising thing. And which is, which are the countries at the top? Both, you see. I was also surprised, I must say, when I saw that. Japan is low. The lowest is Netherlands, at the bottom. Huh? <laughs> yeah, the lowest is Netherlands. And the top? Our country is like, I don't exactly remember the order, but they are all the West Asian countries are at the top. Malaysia is like almost maybe the top of the, you know, and there are some uh, South American countries. And uh, the Malaysian thing has been analyzed and it's because when you are dealing with physical sciences, you're also dealing with computer science. And the computer science field in Malaysia apparently has a huge, you know, the ratio of women is very high. So that gives the ratio of women in physical sciences because computer science is seen as, uh, you know, it's job oriented, it's paying, it's, you know, it's a convenient, comfortable job, etc. So, you know, it, it's, uh, there cannot be one answer for each country has to be there. You have to look at each country separately. <laughs> so I think that in this context, with regard to a fairly conservative country, Korea, when we looked at the numbers on this, mm. and they've had a very weird, I mean, the point I think is that this is a very complex system. You can't just take one metric and say this leads to something. Yeah. So in Korea, they found, it's highly conservative, and they found that the number of women in physics has actually gone up significantly in the last 10, 15, 15 years. And the reason is actually strange, the reason at least as attributed by Koreans, mm -hmm. is because there's pressure on men to get high paying jobs. Mm -hmm. And so therefore they tend, therefore science is not aspirational. Mm -hmm. So you tend to go away from science into things like software or management or whatever. And so then there's an opening left for women to move into science. Yeah. And there's no pressure on women to, to do anything. And so you wind up strangely with a, with a positive outcome. Yeah. The negative but this we are seeing in many states, like I mean Delhi with which I am familiar, Karnataka, uh, science is not for the school leaver, science is not, you know, the mark, what, what do they call it, cut off marks and all, science is not the highest, the highest is commerce, the highest is commerce, commerce is where you want to go. So this is what, I mean this is, it is, uh, the figures I am not sure because whether the figures are sufficient to say that, but when we were working with the like irrigation engineers, you know, there, it was, there was some scholarship scheme for South Asia, and like out of 25 or something, 22 were all women came, irrigation engineers. And so that is not just, you know, in India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, and um, then they're all who have done civil engineering and come into irrigation engineering through that line. So, but it is complex, there's no one, you know, I think that is a very important thing to emphasize. There's no one factor in all of this. So, it is a complex, there are push factors, there are pull factors. That probably is coming back to your discussion about the notion of innate ability. Mm -hmm. There is no gene for science or for research. There are very few, even for medical diseases, there are very few individual genes. So, you have a complex of things and some give you... Uh, a predisposition, if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. how do you emphasize those predispositions? That's your environment, and that will determine what you become. Yeah, yeah. You raised that question, so you heard the answer. <laughs> I heard his answer. <laughs> Okay, so maybe thank we'll stop here and thanks to me again. Thank, thank you. Excellent talk. <laughs> I'll talk to you. Uh, so around for a few more minutes. If somebody wants to actually chat with her, they can. Um, and then you have to leave at some point. No, no, yeah. yeah. You're, you're yeah, around yeah, for yeah, yeah. some. Yeah, so yeah. feel free to chat with her. Right. <laughs> thank you.